Well, good morning and thank you for joining us here today for your word for the day. My name is Robert, glad to have you here. Today we're gonna to be looking at Genesis chapter 38 and let's just say this chapter is a little bit of an interesting one. I won't be able to cover every single detail of what takes place uh, in the time that I have available here. So I encourage you to go and read it on your own. But to, to place what's happening here, Jacob's sons have conspired to get rid of their brother Joseph, as we saw yesterday, and sell him as a slave to Egypt. And we'll be following his story in depth in the, the coming days and weeks. But before we do that, Genesis goes with a little side story with the one who actually suggested slavery instead of murdering Joseph, and that is his brother Judah. In chapter 38, we're told that he leaves his brothers and goes off to another land, uh, presumably to try to make a name for himself. And he does, just not the way that he was probably hoping to. He starts this dramatic chapter by marrying a Canaanite woman, something that was not supposed to happen according to their patriarch's instructions. But still, through this marriage, he's able to have three sons with his wife. The story then turns to his firstborn son named Ur. And he marries yet another Canaanite woman named Tamar and she's gonna be pretty vital to the rest of these events. And we aren't told exactly what Ur did, but apparently his wickedness was so great that the Lord enacted immediate justice and killed Ur in response to his wickedness, leaving Tamar a childless widow. Now, according to the law of the Old Testament, Ur's brothers were to marry Tamar since she was a childless widow. They were to provide a son or sons for her and care for her and provide for her. However, Judah's secondborn, Onan, doesn't like that plan, and he acts selfishly, and the Lord strikes him dead also. Now, at this point, Judah has a responsibility to care for his widowed daughter-in-law. Now, he has a third son who's not quite old enough for marriage, so he tells Tamar to wait around and come and live in the household. But as the trend goes, Judah also ignores his responsibility and does not give Tamar to be a wife to his third son leaving her in a place where she has no husband, no children, and also in that culture, legally no ability to go and pursue a, hus a husband because of their customs. Now, just when the story can't get any weirder, it does. Tamar sees that Judah is gonna go uh, and going to continue to abdicate his responsibility, so she takes matters into her own hands. She hears that he's gonna be traveling and she disguises herself and tricks him into sleeping with her. She ends up getting pregnant with twin boys, and Judah, not knowing that they were his sons, orders her to be killed for her immorality. However, Tamar thought ahead. She has proof that it was, in fact, Judah who made her pregnant. And upon discovering this, he finally takes responsibility for his actions and also admits his wrongs in failing to provide for her. Now, if you're hearing this, and maybe like me at first reading of this chapter, preparing for this, you're wondering what in the world we can glean from this story full of drama and wickedness and immorality. Well, first, as an obvious caveat to this, we have to understand that not all of the Bible is prescriptive for our life, which is text that instructs us in what to do. Much of the Old Testament in particular is descriptive, which is telling the story and describing the events that have happened without necessarily instructing us to live that way. And that is definitely the case here. But the big thing we can learn from this story and learn from Judah especially, is that going against God's plan for our life never leads to what we want. The, the family had been warned to be careful with the Canaanites, especially not to marry them. But Judah makes friends with a Canaanite man named Hera, and he becomes so close that he moves to be close to him and ends up marrying a Canaanite woman. These decisions began a life that played out Proverbs 13, 20, which says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. See, the tragedy of his sons and of his own life comes back to the decisions that Judah made not to follow God's plan for his life, his friends, his wife, and his children. So if you're tempted to veer outside of God's plan for your life, remember that that never brings about the blessing you desire. But here's the good news. God redeems. Even though, even through this messed up family, God brought about amazing redemption. See, Tamar's oldest son was named Perez, and eight generations later, the line of Perez is Jesse, who is the father of King David, who you may know was in the lineage of Jesus himself. So out of all the sons of Jacob, out of all the sin and immorality of drama of Judah and his family here, God brings about redemption by using this family to continue the genealogy that would eventually bring about our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And we get this wonderful reminder every time you open to the Gospel of Matthew, because there in verse 2 of chapter 1, both Judah and Tamar are listed by name in the line that leads to Jesus. So remember that God's plan is always best in life, but even when we veer from it, know that God redeems, and he can bring about good from even the worst moments of our life, because God is good and God is faithful even when we may not be. Take hold of that today at Calvary, and remember to always trust in God's plan for your life. We'll see you next time.